Hello and welcome everybody to ICMDA webinars. I'm Dr. Peter Saunders, the Chief Executive of the International Christian Medical and Dental Association, which brings together around 60,000 Christian doctors and dentists from over 80 countries worldwide. And uh, today, this is the 128th uh, webinar, uh, which we started during COVID. And we have privileged to have Professor John Wyatt back with us again today, but speaking on a different subject, what are old people for? Christian discipleship and the demographic time bomb. And I'm certainly looking forward to learning more about what uh, but I'm for. And I, and I think many of you will uh, resonate with those questions. So it's a pleasure uh, to introduce Professor John Wyatt again today on the subject, what are old people for? Christian discipleship and the demographic time bomb. Uh, John writes, many people who cease their main professional work in their late 50s and early, early 60s today can expect to have 25 to 30 years of healthy life uh, ahead of them. But what are these years actually for? And why is God giving so many older people to Christian churches around the world? So instead of viewing the demographic time bomb as a threatening social disaster, as some do, we should be focusing on the many opportunities that old age brings, whilst preparing as well for the challenges and losses that go along with increasing dependence and learning to let go progressively with thankfulness, hope and anticipation. Professor Wyatt is Emeritus Professor of Neonatal Pediatrics at the University of College London. He's a senior lecturer at the Faraday Institute, Cambridge, and also president of the UK Christian Medical Fellowship, which is one of the national members of ICMDA. He's got a clinical background as a pediatrician caring for sick and premature infants, and also as a medical scientist re researching into the prevention of brain injury in newborn babies. He's always been interested in ethical dilemmas raised by advances in mental medical technology and frequently engaged in public and professional consultations and debates from the perspective of the Christian faith. His voice, or his book, Matters of Life and Death, which will be familiar to many here, Human Dilemmas at the, in the Light of the Christian Faith, has been translated into more than 10 languages. And his most recent book with the intriguing title, The Robot Will See You Now, uh, is, is just out. He's contributed a chapter also to a new book called Healthy Faith and the Coronavirus Crisis in the last couple of years. And uh, John and his wife Celia are longstanding members of All Souls Church in London, where John Stott was the uh, the pastor for, for many years. So John, it's just lovely to have you back again here. And uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Peter. And it's a real privilege for me to be able to join uh, in this uh, webinar today. And I'm going to start sharing my screen. So I hope you can see the screen there. And um, what are old people for? Uh, well, it's, it's a very uh, close to home, this issue, because I've just had my 70th birthday. And so uh, I'm not just speaking in theory, but someone very much uh, who is who is wrestling with this issue myself. Uh, I thought this image, which uh, ICMDA used to um, uh, for promotional purposes, actually illustrates the point quite well. We have in the background, we have these images of footballers, of, of youth and uh, vitality. And then we have this rather pathetic trio uh, struggling on. And uh, this is very much, I think, uh, an image which which so many uh, people have in in the world today so what is clear is that we are facing a, a most extraordinary changes in life expectancy and uh, if you look in the uk at the official statistics uh, they state that people aged 65 uh, in 2020 can be expected to live for between 20 and 22 years and that's going to increase rising uh, by 2045. And of course, these are just average figures. So uh, in reality, you, 
as we all know, you get many people living into their 90s and beyond. And astonishingly, of babies born this year in the UK, one in five girls and one in six boys are expected to live beyond 100 years. Now, of course, as we project into the future, nobody really knows what could happen. And there are some, there is some evidence that life expectancy in some of the richer countries is actually starting to decline uh, slightly. Whether this is a temporary phenomenon or not uh, remains to be seen. But the, the general picture that uh, somebody who uh, starts, stops their professional work maybe in their late 50s or early 60s, and certainly for those of us who are healthcare professionals, we find in many countries, including in the UK, it's increasingly apparent that we're not required uh, or even wanted in our, um, in our professional capacities. And then the question comes, well, potentially we have 25 to 30 years of healthy life ahead of us, and what are those years for? And it's interesting, if you look at um, global life expectancy, this is this is something which is happening across the world. I just looked out some of these this this data. I'm going to show three pictures of the world in 1800, in 1950 and 2015. So this is life expectancy in 1800s. And you can see that uh, in Europe, life expectancy was 34 years, average in America is 35, in Africa 26 years, in Asia 28 years. But when we move forward to 1950, we can already see dramatic changes. In Europe and America, average life expectancy has gone up to the 60s. In China, it's in the 40s. In India and in Africa, it's in the 30s, mid-30s on average. And then when we get to 2015, again, the most dramatic changes have actually been in Africa and in Asia. So China has gone up to 76, India to 68, and most of Africa is in the uh, 50s or 60s, uh, Europe in the 80s. And of course, this is already out of date uh, seven years ago. And no doubt, overall, life expectancy is continuing to rise. So it's a global phenomenon. And uh, of course, this is having huge demographic uh, changes, not just in the rich countries, but across the world. And uh, this is a graph which plots on the horizontal axis. You can see age going from zero to 80 plus and on the vertical axis, you can see consumption and production, income, economic income and consumption. And so what we see by the income, of course, it starts to rise. It reaches a peak in your 40s and 50s, and then it falls very rapidly so that by the time people are in their 70s, the income is virtually zero. Whereas, of course, consumption continues across the lifespan and tends to increase. And um, it's interesting that in the UK, uh, consumption is higher um, than in these other European countries. Although, interestingly, in Sweden, which has a very good uh, social network, as uh, social services, elderly costs rise rapidly as you get beyond 75. And of course, this is the reason why economists are concerned that as more and more people end up in this category, their consumption is uh, high, but their economic productivity is very low. And this leads to really alarming statistics. How, as we uh, look across into the future, how as our societies are we going to um, support uh, so many elderly people when the numbers of economically productive uh, younger people are less. And I think it's easy when we take this rather uh, blunt economic perspective to see long life as in many ways a burden, as a problem. And that's often the way, isn't it? This very negative under, uh, concept of a demographic time bomb. And I was struck by these words of Ian Knox uh, in, a, in his book about aging, a long life is a gift, not a curse. It is full of possibilities. And the gift is the gift of time. 
And so I think trying to reorientate our thinking and, and thinking um, in much more biblical terms about the benefits, the blessing of a long life, I think is, is important for us. But it's also striking how not only is there a kind of, if we, do we live in a, in a culture which is increasingly youth orientated, where young people uh, and, and youth is seen as being the most important thing. I think it's striking how much, how many of our churches and Christian communities also focus on young people and young families. I just looked across the internet uh, and, and found many of these images from churches around the world um, giving an image of its youth or its young families. Uh, these are, this is the image we wish to protect, project to the world. And I think many church leaders too, their focus seems to be so often on young people. This is, you know, this is where we want to put our resources and we want to try and attract more young people. We want to try and attract young families and students. And, and the elderly are just regarded as a sort of almost like a nuisance or some kind of ballast, you know, we, well, I suppose we, we should make some provision for the old people. But really, it's young people we need to concentrate on. And increasingly, I think, yes, of course, we do need to attract young people. Yes, of course, we need to have um, family services and so on. But I think we shouldn't fall into a kind of ageism which regards old people as almost invisible and as of having really little uh, to contribute in the Christian community. So Peter Laslett uh, is a social historian who wrote some very influential work, uh, which has often been picked up by other writers and thinkers about the life course. And he focused on four ages. Uh, the first age was of childhood, immaturity, there was dependence, there was socializing, and, and there were learning. But then in the second age is the longest age, is the, lay, is the age of maturity, independence. You're responsible, you're the working person, you're providing for other people. And then with retirement comes the third age. And the third age, Laslett said, was, was a, an age for fulfillment, for personal achievement, to, to focus on your own possibilities. And then finally, there was the fourth age. And the fourth age was a final dependence, decrepitude, dwindling, and death. And it's interesting that this, this, these four ages have been taken up uh, by um, planners and, and uh, including healthcare and social care planners. And their aim is to emphasize the third age. Their aim is to try to promote the concept of the third age and to prolong it as much as possible and to try to minimize the fourth age. And so um, the third age is often being described as an age of, of healthy aging or productive aging. Um, and the UN is currently having a decade of healthy aging. And this is the UK public health, productive, healthy aging. And, and what does this in, consist of? Well, it's resilience, uh, physical and cognitive reserve, it's, it's physical health, it's connectedness, social support and friendships. It's having meaning and purpose, including things like caring for others, volunteering and financial security. This is what healthy aging looks like. It's interesting, again, if you go onto the internet, you see all these images. This is, this is what healthy aging looks like. And they're all smiling, they're all fit, they're all healthy, they're looking after their own health. You know, the people on the right are burning through their children's inheritance, enjoying fine wine and food. Um, this, is, this is a kind of image uh, which is being promoted, that this, this is what we should be doing. We should be basically uh, living active, vigorous, independent lives, enjoying it ourselves. And uh, this is the, the third age which we're aiming to maximize and promote as much as possible. Uh, and what about the fourth age? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? And, and of course, 
there's obvious differences between different cultures around the world on these attitudes to the elderly and in particularly to the dependent elderly but it's it's interesting to me that the fourth age of dependence and these were just random pictures which i got from the internet are, is so often seen almost entirely as in as a negative thing dependence is seen as something which is is dehumanizing which which where we lose our ability to define ourselves we become dependent on others for our care needs and and it ultimately seems so humiliating and it is interesting to me just as a side issue that uh, in many countries euthanasia or, or assisted suicide is being promoted as an answer to the fourth age yes we should promote the third age we should we should encourage people to live healthy aging and make the most of it but once you get to the fourth age then frankly uh, what is the point of carrying on and uh, and and you could see how at one level uh, within that way of thinking assisted suicide or euthanasia seems almost like a blessing a way of bringing this meaningless dependent existence to an end so trying to reflect on these uh, issues from a christian and a biblical point of view i think that the, the the common metaphor we find scripture of the long distance race uh, that life is a long distance race i think it's a very helpful matter to, to reflect on and uh, and one of the obvious faces we find it in is hebrews 12 with these familiar words therefore since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So this image of a, of a race which is set before us, uh, it's a long distance race, and we need to throw off the things that are getting in the way and that hinder us. We need perseverance. We have an individual race marked out for us. You know, the runners in a marathon don't decide which way to go. They don't decide what course they're going to take. It's all been marked out for them in advance. Their job is to run the race to the best of their ability. And it's interesting, though, that the word which the writer to the Hebrews was in Greek for marked out for us, is exactly the same word as the word which is used for the joy marked out for Jesus. It's a pity that some of the translations express it differently because you miss the implication. The implication is that Jesus too had his race marked out for him, but it was a race ultimately about joy. And so it does seem to me that the same we can see the same for us yes our race involves suffering it, it, it requires perseverance but ultimately it's about joy and running a, a, a race i've never run a marathon the most i've ever managed is 10k i know peter you, you've run marathons before but what i understand is that when you're running that kind of distance you have to think about the later stages of the race. You have to plan ahead, you know, to conserve my energy stores, to make sure I'm maintaining hydration, to plan how I'm going to run those final miles or kilometers. Um, and I'm told that, that sometimes that final stretch can be the most dangerous of the whole race if I haven't planned carefully for how I'm going to run those final stages. And I think when we apply that metaphor to ourselves, then those of us who are aging also need to plan ahead as to how we're going to run those final stages of our own individual race. Uh, we need to reflect on the particular gifts and the callings, the resources and the responsibilities that we have at this particular stage as we're coming to the final 
stages of our race. So, so that's the question, how should we run these final stages uh, when we start to see the finishing line appearing ahead of us? And um, related to that, therefore, is the question is, is what are old people for? And in particular, what are old people for in the church? Because God does seem to be giving to the church and to Christian communities around the world an awful lot of old people. And so I think this is an important question which we need to think about. And I certainly am not proposing that I have all the answers. I certainly don't. But I see this webinar and this discussion as 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 a way of starting the discussion that, that between us we start to reflect what are old people for. And I'm going to make a number of suggestions of what I think old people are for, but I'm interested to hear other ideas and suggestions. But one of the obvious things I think is prayerfulness that uh, historically, as we look in the Christian church, old people have so often been um, symbols of prayerfulness, especially older people praying and supporting and caring for the younger generations. Then there's being a listening ear. I mean, one of the things that struck me having um, reached the age of 70 is that I have the gift of increased availability which for others, which I certainly didn't have when I was in the middle of working as a consultant pediatrician uh, in the NHS. And that ability to make yourself available at short notice to others is, is an extraordinary gift. Then there's the idea of investing in the next generation um, and particularly investing in deep intergenerational friendships, passing on to the younger generation, offering life wisdom. Um, as we have uh, accumulated many years following Christ, we've seen wonderful things, we've seen blessings, but we've also seen often many sorrows and tragedies many of us have been through deep waters suffering a failure breakdown bereavement and i think often interestingly when we have offer life wisdom to others it's often those experiences the experiences of the reality of what it's like to suffer to, to follow christ in particular through the dark times which can be particularly helpful and beneficial uh, to younger people sharing our faith and hope in Christ with others. One of the fascinating things is there is quite a lot of evidence that older people are more open to the gospel um, than the many younger people. It often seems as though other old people who've, you know, they, the baby boomers, they've made, had been through the baby boomer generation, they've maybe done quite well financially, uh, they've had a good career, uh, they've accumulated some financial resources and they're now coming to the end of their life and they're thinking is that it is that really all that life was about and so surprisingly there can be a real openness to to talk about the gospel to talk about the meaning of life and so on and i think some churches have found that whereas uh, evangelism and outreach amongst young adults is often uh, there's a great deal of resistance Surprisingly, it's older people where there, there's openness. And the other interesting thing is I think that many Christians who are older find a kind of freedom of being able to talk and share their faith, which they didn't have when they were working as professionals. Uh, now that I'm an emeritus professor, it doesn't really matter uh, what I say. Uh, nobody's that worried about what I say. And that gives me a kind of liberation and ability to share my faith that I didn't have uh, when I was working in the university and in the National Health Service. Expressing gratitude and thankfulness. I do think that this is one of the particular roles we ought to have as older people. And interestingly, I think as you get older, it's often the smaller things, the, the frequently ignored blessings of creation, family and human friendship. My wife and I have been spending time with our grandchildren, one grandchild in particular that we get, visit every week. And we were both commenting on the fact that when we were, were parents of young children, 
whenever we were there, we were often just trying to get on to do the next thing, you know, thinking, you know, being frustrated that they were so slow and they didn't. Now we don't have an agenda. We can just enjoy the time that we're spending with our young grandchild and, 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 and enjoy this stage of life. And I think this is something just being grateful uh, for the for the good things and often the small things, the small gifts of creation, providing positive models of letting go. You know, one of the things about the previous generation, particularly the war generation here in the UK, is that they were ferociously independent and they resisted any kind of help. And as we've watched those older people come to the end of their lives, they've often been clinging on desperately, refusing to accept help, refusing to move out of their homes, uh, resisting any offers uh, of help or care. And I think we can learn from them and we learn that we actually it's much better to let go progressively and graciously, as you can see the need to move into dependence, not hanging on desperately. Leaving behind a legacy of wisdom and a testimony to God's character. So. It's a theme we find in scripture repeatedly, don't we? That, that older people have a calling to remember and remind themselves and remind the children of what God has done in our lives and to, and to provide a personal testimony to God's faithfulness. And then hopefulness, constantly pointing to the resurrection, looking forward uh, and to the new creation. Uh, and instead of uh, falling into the temptation of becoming cynical, bitter, resentful, which I'm afraid it's always a temptation as we approach the end of our lives. Finding our deepest joy. I think one of the important concepts is that although life has, we all have duties and responsibilities, musts and shoulds and oughts, they, these things are often draining and tiring. They sap our energy. And so at the later stages of life, as our energy levels drop, we need to look especially to those things which thrill our hearts, the forms of service which can energize and motivate us. And again, it's interesting that Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. He was motivated by joy, the joy of resurrection, of winning his bride, of inaugurating a new creation. And I love this quote by Frederick Buchner, who says, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. You know, I can't help thinking about this as an X, Y graph, you know, along one axis is the, our deep hunger, our deep gladness. And along the other axis is the world's deep hunger. And the point where they intersect is the point where God is calling us to serve. So we need to look for those moments in our life when our heart sings, when we say, oh, this is what I'm made for. This is my deepest joy, because that's where the energy lies. And, and we see this in, this in Psalm 103, where the psalmist says, God satisfies you with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. It's being satisfied with good that energizes us, uh, that renews our youth. What about the fourth age? Um, and it, I, I think instead of this very negative uh, view, we have to have this very countercultural understanding that, that God designs us to be dependent. It's not, dependence is not a consequence of the fall. It's part of our creation. Um, the fact that we are created out of the dust of the earth means that we are weak and, and, the, and dependent. The Hebrew word for human, Adam, is derived from Adama, the ground. So in the literal Hebrew, we are groundlings. And we are designed to be frail, to be dependent, to be limited, to be vulnerable and contingent. And not only are we designed to depend on God, we're designed to depend on one another. We're created to be bonded together. 
in lives of mutual dependence. And that's really what families are all about, uh, uh, to live lives depending on one another, of being burdens to one another, or has been described of mutual burdensomeness. And of course, it's Paul in Galatians who says, bear one another's burdens, and so you will fulfill the law of Christ. So instead of seeing this as a very negative and dehumanizing uh, stage of life, we should be prepared even to welcome it as the next stage, as proof that we are ending the journey, that we are coming to the, late, the later stages of the race. Gilbert Mylander wrote an article, he's a theologian who wrote an article entitled, I want to burden my family. And he writes, is this not in large measure what it means to belong to a family, to burden each other and to find almost miraculously that others are willing, even happy, to carry such burdens. It's true for a human family and it should be true too for the Christian family and the local church. And yet many Christians continue to worry. A friend of mine did a recent research study. She interviewed a number of older Christians about issues around dependence and how they would feel if they became dependent on others. And what was striking was how many were worrying about what dependence would mean to their loved ones. And they were painfully aware of the inadequacies of government provided health and social care and worried about their implications for their loved ones. And of course, we cannot sanitize these. These are issues we need to discuss openly amongst ourselves in families, with our loved ones, and with our closest friends before our own personal crisis strikes. But what I find very striking is that if you take the list that I looked at before, what are old people for? What is so wonderful is actually, we can continue these roles, even in dependence and disability, we can still continue to live fruitful, productive, and God glorifying lives. These things don't depend on having that amazing physical agility of the third age. Uh, even in dependence, we can still carry out these uh, activities that God calls us to. So as I come to the end, uh, these famous words in 2 Corinthians, so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For our light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, the things that are unseen are eternal. So it does seem to me that as we enter into particularly into the fourth age of dependence, we need to learn to fix our eyes increasingly, not on the externals, but to the internal, the fact that internal growth can continue all the way until we meet our Lord. And we increasingly we fix our eyes on the things that are unseen, because the things that are unseen are eternal. And so, I close again with this quote, a long life is a gift, not a curse. It's full of possibilities. And the gift is the gift of time. So I'm very keen to co continue this discussion to think about the possibilities. How can we help one another to, to grow well? How can we help one another to uh, become the elderly people that God made us to be? And this is one of my favorite verses in the whole of the Bible. You know, in, in the secular thinking, you have the first age, you grow to this maturity, and then it's the long downhill slide, isn't it? You know, from the age of 25, our cells are aging, our DNA is corroding, our muscles are withering, our brains are, are um, atrophying, and it's down, down, down. But in Christian thinking, the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn shining ever brighter until the full light of day. So here are some resources. Uh, I recommend to you the UK organization Faith in Later Life. And uh, there's some 
books, which uh, we can also make available in the notes and the PDF to this uh, to this talk. And uh, these are my own books and uh, just a mention of my own website, johnwire.com. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, John. Well, I, I, I certainly feel much more encouraged and positive about the future. <laughs> after hearing your talk and you know thanks uh for just bringing the science and the christian hope uh together uh, in something that's been incredibly comprehensive and practical as well so uh well let's come to the questions first one it, it, it's interesting to I, I know a lot of these people who are asking questions john and they tend to be more your yours and my end of life than the others uh, a lot of familiar names. Howard Lyons, first of all, um, and he's he's got six upvotes from people wanting this desperately to be asked. So here we are. Does the concept of retirement have any biblical justification, or is it a relatively recent notion enabled by our greater longevity and the introduction of state pensions a hundred years ago? You know, your 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 ages. Uh, from 1800, 1950, and 2015 were remarkable. You know, it, it, it's a gift that others didn't have. And I guess, you know, th there have been evangelicals like, uh, you know, John Piper's well known, isn't he, for the don't waste your life, don't spend time gathering seashells and playing golf and shuffleboard and so on. You, you know, make the most of the time that's left. But what, what, what's the, the biblical justification for retirement, for stopping? paid employment i guess it's a good question and i i think um i see the comment that priests did retire from from serving in the tabernacle and i think i think that was certainly there was a recognition that age aged people of course were pretty unusual in biblical times but they there always were a few who survived to enormous ages but they would they had special roles so I think we do just live in a totally different age. And that's the challenge, isn't it? Because this is the first time this happened in the history of the world uh, to have this extraordinary um, extension of life. And, and yet, I mean, from a, so I, I, I think probably we, we're going to look in vain if we want to find biblical, um, a particular biblical theology of retirement, but I think there's no avoiding its reality. I mean, I worked as a neonatologist, which is an intensely uh, uh, demanding specialty, uh, intellectually, emotionally, physically. And I found as I was approaching my 60s, it was simply impossible to carry on at the level that was demanded of a, of a neonatologist. It was simply a younger person's game. And so I think it's inevitable that most of us are not going to be able to carry on doing the professional jobs in healthcare or in other areas that we did um, much beyond 60. Um, and therefore, and yet we have these 30 years plus ahead of us. And so I do think to, that's why this kind of conversation is important. Uh, I, I think it's it, it's a new reality which which has never before really been an issue. But we are the first generation who's been given this gift, almost the first generation, and therefore we need to do some some new thinking to 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 develop a positive but biblically consistent way of thinking about this. Yeah, which is it's great to see you thinking and speaking on this issue. And I, I hope, I'm wondering when the book's going to come out um, <laughs> on this particular subject, because there's a huge need for it, isn't there? Um, Chris Pringer's uh, comment first, or how do you think the grief issues that used to be issues for the elderly uh, are now impacting youth more, resulting in a, a mental health epidemic in that? group that life includes grief suffering failure has now become more part of the awareness of youth who haven't yet had time to develop resilience so it's 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 both a comment and a and a question really you know what what why is it happening and what's it what's it telling us about uh, our role as a church perhaps 
I, th I think it's a really good point. Um, I, I think that um, many people had the privilege of having relatively stable youth and early maturity to build a foundation for your life so that when the tragedies, the bereavements, the challenges came later on in life, you had already built by God's grace um, some some degree of resilience, stability, uh, character and so on. And I think it is an issue of enormous concern that there, there is this epidemic of mental health problems, particularly amongst teenagers and young adults. And, and therefore, that must have implications later on in their life, must it? If, if they've been struggling with profound anxiety, depression, eating disorders, and so on, right from early on, uh, that is going to have implications for later on. And, and um, I, so I, I think it's just an, an issue to be aware of. But of course, mental, I think we're much more aware of mental health issues happen throughout the life course. Yeah. And therefore, we need to be uh, supporting people at every stage uh, as these issues may arise. There's a couple of questions here about uh, the role of caring for elderly people and, and the effect that, or, or the results of that for, for everyone, not just the elderly people. Uh, Jean, Jean Rudd, who you'll know well, Jean was the associate CEO of CMDA US for many years and still very active. Uh, he says, John, isn't the care of the elderly also an opportunity to shape our lives as caretakers? Hopefully we become more Christ-like as someone who cared for our children until they're adults and then cared for our parents until they're passing and now caring for siblings, I'm still on that learning curve. Eventually my needs will be an opportunity for someone else to learn to serve. I mean, you, you often hear families with, it, with disabled people saying how, well, how having a, a person with disability in the family actually enriched the family and taught them to love and serve in ways that they wouldn't have been aware of before. But it's it's more a comment, but but your reflections on that, John. On Yeah. Hi, Jean, and thanks very much for those comments. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. And I think I should definitely add that on uh, to, to my list, that uh, there is a real um, privilege of being involved in the carers. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, my wife and I, we're, and I'm sure there are many other people on this call in a similar situation, we would be examples of the squeezed middle because we're still caring for the older generation who are in their 90s and who have very substantial care needs. And at the same time, we're providing care for our grandchildren. Uh, and therefore, there are uh, real uh, care needs. We're, we're squeezed on both directions. And yet, I think you're right, we need to see that actually as an extraordinary privilege, an opportunity of learning um, and growing, and particularly perhaps learning in humility that, that um, uh, of the, the experience of caring uh, is, is, is an experience which, which we, we learn more about what it means to give our lives for others. Thank you. Uh, Rod McRory is saying many church networks seem to be struggling to provide leaders with our experience and financial independence. Should not more of us in in the retirement age be taking on leadership responsibility in the church? I think he's specifically talking about. Well, thanks. Yes. And I think absolutely. I think I think um, many older Christians who have who who do have a life experience and Christian uh, teaching and wisdom can potentially play very important roles in um, in church leadership here in the UK. There's a whole movement in the Church of England of uh, ordaining people in their sixties and seventies even uh, to take on church leadership. But of course, it doesn't have to be in positions of leadership. I think all of us can play a role within our local church communities. Often, it seems to me, it's in the kind of hidden availability, being a listening ear, intergenerational friendships, 
Um, often I think those roles are just as important as taking on the public profile roles of, of church leadership. Uh, with regard to, to doctors and dentists specifically, John, people who are offering, often taking early retirement, I'm, I'm aware of a lot of uh, GPs and hospital doctors who are retiring in their late 50s or, uh, you know, or very early 60s as well. Uh, what, what specific role is there? Are there things that only we can do at that age with a background of experience that could be helpful to uh, Christ's mission in, in the church and in the world? No, I think this is a really important point. And I think this is where the Buchner quote about the, the heart's deep gladness and the world's deep need is helpful. You know, because, of course, somebody who's retiring as a health professional and who loves the job of, of medical, clinical uh, care or whatever kind of care they're in, then the question is, well, where can I find this intersection between what God has given me and what I love doing and the world's deep need? And, and for some people, that might be in international medical service. I know many older doctors who've, who've traveled to uh, other countries, low resource countries, uh, it, but it can be in other innovative ways of using the particular skills and experience that they've accumulated from their clinical life. Now, perhaps in some volunteer capacity in an unpaid uh, capacity and so on, I think there are many, many opportunities and, and we, we need to just think outside the box to be open to um, to God's calling to lead us in, in surprising and unusual ways. Is there any personal reflections, John? I mean, you're you're seventy. You've you've retired from clinical work. I know you're still very, very active. What what's um what what's really what what's been the intersection of joy and need for, for you as you go forward? Yeah, no, thanks, Pete. I when I retired from the NHS, uh, I was in just approaching sixty, and I I was really went through a, a year or two of quite unsettled uh not, not at all sure what what um this next phase was and i found talking to others and reflecting praying um about my future direction really important and, and helpful and for me um the the things which most i came to the conclusion really set my heart on fire are helping God's people to understand the modern world we live in and, and creating new content, uh, writing and developing materials, uh, and also investing in the next generation on a one-to-one -one basis, um, developing friendships with uh, young doctors, medical students, uh, others, uh, young, younger people. Um, I'm just so grateful that God has given me these opportunities. And, and surprisingly, the pandemic for me um, has turned out to open up many other opportunities, not including, <laughs> including, and not only the, but um, these kind of webinars, you know, the internet has provided an enormous opportunities uh, for many of us to, um, to have ministries which we never anticipated uh, that God has opened doors. And, and so, um, my heart's greatest joy is actually in doing this kind of thing, being able to share with others and learn from others and, and, and pass on what God has given us. And I guess also without necessarily involving air travel as well. <laughs> Absolutely. So that, that's a blessing. There's a tendency sometimes, you know, a temptation perhaps for us in later life to to pine and long for the good old days, you know, when things were so much better and and the or, or we, we perceive it that way. And, and the flip side of that is that that uh, younger people are perhaps looking at us and saying, uh, as uh, Augustine, has, Augustine is one of our AOs for ICMDA, is saying here, you know, things have changed, adapt or die, you know? Uh, <laughs> I, I, almost the idea that old people are irrelevant because the world that they grew up in is so much different from the world that the younger generation is growing up in today and the idea that you know is our experience of being you know in our 20s 30s and 40s relevant 
to younger people today because the world, their world, so much different than than ours. So at the 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 heart of Augustine's question is, you know, can you and how do you provide guidance and for people living in a different world than the one you lived in? And I know you're you're someone who's always kept on the cutting edge of thinking and new developments and you know your latest book the robot will see you now and and so on but but your reflect your reflections on that yeah. i'm just reminded of a wonderful cartoon i saw which which was of a meeting of the dinosaurs there were all these dinosaurs in a lecture theater and there's a dinosaur at the front saying gentlemen we have to face it we're about to be replaced by these pesky mammals <laughs> 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 and um I mean, that's the danger, isn't it? The danger as we age is that we just become rigid. We become backward looking. We become trapped in the past. And I, and I think that's a real temptation. And therefore, if we want to be faithful to Christ, we need to continually be prepared to learn. And yes, of course, it would be possible to get completely out of touch with the, the generations coming after us, but it doesn't have to happen. I think we all know older people who manage to remain relevant, who young people want to engage with, even into their 80s and 90s. And so the question is, how do we become that kind of older person? And it seems to me, this, perhaps the single most important thing is that we need to have the humility to listen to the younger people, to ask questions, to ask them to explain to us, to show interest in them, rather than just to be constantly banging on about our past. But of course, life wisdom is always of value. I mean, we are still human beings, and the children and the grandchildren who come after us are still human beings, and we still serve the same God. And so what we do have to offer to the next generations is of value, even if they don't see it as a value. And we need to find ways of, of being relevant, of being approachable, of being supportive and encouraging. Um, and as God gives us ability, uh, passing on uh, to the next generation what he has given us. You've alluded already to the, the difficulties and the, and the challenges, and particularly of the fourth stage. And Richard Winter, psychiatrist, who again you'll know well, Richard says many old people have limitations of brain function, especially dementia. <clears throat> this is a result of the fall, and the dependence is not what God desires for us. Uh, he grieves over it, as, as do we. Perhaps we have to learn to enter into lament in the later years, as well as the positive things that you speak of just some reflections on the place of lament in older life and in the church and of course so much of the psalms touches on that theme doesn't it yeah thanks very much richard and again i i'm, I'm sure you're right and i totally agree with you that dementia is of course is not the same as uh normal uh, aging and and is a part of the fall and having had a mother with dementia and very close friends who suffer with dementia there was a great deal of 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 pain and 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 loss and and yes there is a, pla a place for lament and um and i think recovering this idea of biblical lament i have uh, found the writings of some uh, theologians particularly john swinton who's written about lament uh, extremely helpful and um and it is it is part of uh of aging um but of course again it's it's part of all of us i mean lament is something which young people also uh need to engage in but it, uh, absolutely um i don't want to sanitize and and uh present age as though there aren't enormous challenges and losses uh, with which we must be realistic. Hmm. Remember the book, um, the the diving bell and the butterfly, uh, John Dominique Borby, and uh, this was a man who had a, a a stroke and ended up with locked in syndrome and couldn't talk but could still hear and so on. And I remember reading that book and 
being struck by him saying that <clears throat> there were two things that his stroke didn't take away. One was his imagination and the other one was his memory. And he was, he taught himself to be able to live in his imagination and memory. Uh, even I remember other discussions with disabled people where they've, they've said, you know, I don't think about what I can't do. I think about what I can do, uh, which I've found helpful. But Annalise Wilder-Smith is, is saying here that memory is such a part of our cognition and consciousness. What is the value of life in a patient with advanced Alzheimer's dementia or another form of dementia when even recognizing family members has been lost? And, you know, we so often hear people saying, you know, I felt I lost her or lost him some years ago, you know. Yes, it's an incredibly important topic, and I really haven't time to go into it in great detail, and I, I don't feel that I'm a, a real expert in this. But I do think it's important to understand that although it you may seem as though we've lost the person, the person themselves, even in advanced dementia, is still there. What happens is that they become largely inaccessible to us. Mm. Um, but one of the very interesting things about the spiritual care of people with dementia is that people who have experience in this find ways sometimes of, of, of finding windows of lucidity, windows in which they can make contact with the person and, and using things such as music, uh, such as liturgy, um, uh, going back to the childhood memories and so on, uh, so that even in advanced dementia, it, it, it's not hopeless. We should not feel there is no possibility of making contact. And I think Christian love always says it's good to another person. It's good that you exist. It's good that you are in the world. I think so often in the secular world, and, and, and this, of course, again, is what happens with euthanasia, it says it's bad that you exist. It would be much better for the world if you didn't exist. But it seems to me that authentically Christian love never says that. It always says, I can't see what God is doing, but it's good that you're there. And I want to reach out to you uh, with, with love and with compassion and with respect. Thank you. And a, a great note to finish on. We, we have so many more questions still to, to come, but we've run out of time, sadly. But uh, thank you, everyone, for all the lovely comments that you put through the chat about the talk, the way it's uh, stimulated and encouraged you. And for all those who've asked questions, whether we got to them or not. Uh, and otherwise, just remains to me to say thanks to uh, to you, John, particularly for your preparation, your example, and your wisdom today, and to all of you for being part of ICMDA webinars. We look forward to seeing you again in the near future. May the Lord bless you.